The Wild West is filled with tales of people who accomplished extraordinary feats, things we can't even imagine today. While some of us may grumble about reaching for the remote, those pioneers faced challenges far beyond modern inconveniences. There wasn't just a lack of electricity. There weren't even roads. And despite the resistance and shock from the native populations, these incredible stories unfolded in the untamed American frontier, reshaping history in ways we still reflect on today. Here are five of those remarkable tales. Jed Smith crosses the Mojave. Ever been to Vegas? I bet you didn't walk. On what would be his inaugural journey across the Mojave Desert, Jedediah Smith and his group traversed the eastern Great Basin Desert, which Smith famously dubbed the Land of Starvation. After crossing the Colorado River into Arizona, they headed south along the mountains until reaching a Mojave Native American village near Needles, California. Smith encountered the Mojaves initially at a southern Paiute settlement in present-day Utah, where his party arrived exhausted and nearly famished after a grueling journey through the mountains. Since they carried no beaver skins or any trapper goods, signs of being fur traders, they were received with traditional Mojave hospitality. They were fed and guided first down the Virgin River to North Mojave rancherias, and then to the main Mojave settlement in the Mojave Valley. When Smith departed, Mojave guides accompanied him on his journey south to the San Bernardino Valley and Mission San Gabriel. However, their reception there was less than cordial. The mission fathers imprisoned the two Mojave guides, and one was even sentenced to death for aiding a foreigner into Spanish territory. Smith later recorded in his journal that the priest at the mission managed to secure a pardon for the man. Smith returned via a different route, reflecting on the complex and often perilous interactions between explorers, Native Americans, and Spanish authorities during that era. Joseph R. Walker is the real ruler. At the age of 15, Joe Walker and his older brother fought alongside Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, an impressive feat. While I was busy making mixtapes of Duran Duran at that age, Walker grew into an even more remarkable figure. Standing tall at 6'4", with flowing hair and a large beard, he possessed the rare ability to navigate the untamed American West without falling prey to Native Americans, bears, starvation, harsh elements, and various other dangers. What set Walker apart from his contemporaries who shared similar survival skills was his leadership prowess. He possessed foresight, planning abilities, and most crucially, excellent interpersonal skills. These qualities made him a standout figure of his time. So, when the ex-military man Bonneville sought to find a viable route to the Pacific, a challenge not yet accomplished in wagon-friendly terrain, since Lewis and Clark, his choice was clear. Joseph Walker, the epitome of an outstanding individual. Walker embodied everything necessary in a leader venturing into uncharted territories. He had an intimate understanding of wilderness survival and the local indigenous peoples, crucial assets for navigating unfamiliar terrain successfully. Prior to entering the Salt Lake Basin, Walker's party wisely halted at Bear River. There, they hunted until each man had packed 60 pounds of dried and jerked meat a precaution often overlooked by ordinary mountain men who were prone to overindulge during times of plentiful game and suffer shortages later on. This meticulous preparation underscored Walker's practical approach and ensured their survival in the challenging wilderness they traversed. They set off, and upon reaching the Great Basin, Walker's first task was to locate a group of local Native Americans specifically the Shoshone people, to ask for directions. With the information obtained, the party proceeded westward. Along the way, 
they encountered the Paiute Indians, a tribe known for their primitive lifestyle of gathering roots, beetles, lizards, and hunting small game. Referred to as the diggers, they were unfamiliar with the technology and goods of white men. As the trappers sought out meager supplies of beaver, the Native Americans resorted to stealing whatever they could from them. Walker attempted to maintain calm among his men, but some disregarded his advice and ended up killing several individuals who had taken their traps. This action further aggravated the diggers, transforming their greed into anger. Soon, the party found themselves surrounded by a large group estimated between 800 and 900. In response, Walker ordered his men to quickly fortify a defensive position using their packs, behind which they huddled. The Native Americans advanced towards them, but at a distance of about 150 yards, they suddenly sat down on the ground. Five chiefs approached to inquire if Walker's group would join them for a peace talk, a proposal Walker wisely declined. Instead, he demonstrated the capabilities of their rifles by shooting at some unfortunate ducks, hoping to convey their power. However, this gesture did not prevent hostilities, and the next morning, the natives launched an attack as the trappers resumed their journey. With no other recourse left, Walker and his men opened fire, resulting in the deaths of 39 diggers. This decisive action effectively eliminated the immediate threat posed by the Native Americans, concluding the tense encounter. The expedition then began advancing into the Sierra Nevada mountains along a river later named after Walker. Unable to locate a pass, they commenced a challenging ascent, navigating through fields of boulders, snow-filled gorges, and steep-walled canyons, which left them famished and exhausted. Walker managed to prevent mutiny only by permitting the men to slaughter and consume several horses. Seventeen more horses were sacrificed before they encountered substantial game again. It took nearly three weeks of treacherous climbing over icy cliffs and rocky walls to reach the summit. The descent on the western side offered little respite. As they descended, Walker's party became the first documented white men to gaze upon Yosemite Valley. They found a spot where horses could be lowered with ropes, and, after negotiating through boulders, Walker discovered a viable trail. By the end of October 1833, the party caught sight of the Pacific Ocean. Before proceeding to Monterey, the capital of Upper California, they camped near the mission at San Juan Bautista. Walker, through the intervention of an American ship captain, obtained a passport, demonstrating respect for Spanish authority in California, which ensured a favorable reception from the Spanish governor. This diplomatic gesture was crucial, unlike many other explorers of the era who neglected such protocols. Respect and courtesy in foreign lands carried significant weight. Returning via a less challenging route, the Walker party arrived at the Bear River Rendezvous on July 12, 1834, with all trappers accounted for, having discovered a pass that would later become a major route for emigrants heading to California. In 1862, aged 64, and with failing eyesight but still remarkably strong, he was leading a group of gold prospectors through New Mexico when they began to run low on water. Walker assured them that he had traveled this way years earlier and knew the location of a reliable spring to the southwest. On the third day, at the base of a dry and unpromising mountain, Walker instructed them to start climbing, promising that near the summit they would discover a flat rock and the spring. He also warned them to be cautious of Apache raids, True to his word, they found the spring exactly where Walker had described it. His caution about the Native Americans proved accurate, as they encountered three white men hanging by their ankles from a pinion tree the same day. In 1863, he led another group of prospectors 
into what later became known as Horse Thief Basin in Arizona. As supplies of food and water dwindled, Walker, nearly blind by this time, set off with one companion towards the trading post at La Paz, a daunting 200 miles away. Along the way, they were ambushed by a pair of Mexican bandits who caught his companion off guard. Despite his impaired vision, Walker's instincts and reflexes remained sharp. He drew his weapon and fired, successfully driving the outlaws away. Joe Walker passed away on October 27, 1876, at the age of 78. He was laid to rest in Martinez, California, leaving behind a legacy of exploration, resilience, and leadership in the American West. John C. Fremont is not dead. Where to begin with John C. Fremont? To start, he serves as a prime example of the impact of propaganda in history. If you relied solely on his accounts, though it was actually his brilliant and talented wife who did the writing, you would believe he was the most heroic and dashing adventurer ever. However, the most remarkable accounts of Fremont's explorations come from the letters of his topographer, a meticulous German named Charles Proust. Let's start at the beginning. Fremont first met Kit Carson on a Missouri River steamboat in St. Louis during the summer of 1842. Fremont was preparing to lead his first expedition, a role he secured through the political connections of his wife and influential father-in-law, and he needed a guide to take him to South Pass. Carson, who was familiar with the area, offered his services. The five-month journey, undertaken with 25 men, was a success largely due to Carson's skills and knowledge. During this expedition, significant topographic information was collected, primarily by Preuss, whom Fremont viewed as a reliable assistant. Preuss's letters reveal a different story, describing himself as a gloomy man frustrated by the childish Fremont. In one amusing incident, Fremont and his party crossed the Rockies via South Pass, a wide, sandy saddle that lacked the dramatic scenery Fremont had envisioned. Disappointed by the anticlimactic landscape, Fremont didn't even bother to take topographical observations at the crest. A few days later, upon reaching the Wind River Range, Fremont decided to climb what he arbitrarily believed to be the tallest peak in the Rockies. The peak he chose, later named after him, stood at only 13,7 feet, lower than Gannett Peak just five miles away, and shorter than 55 other mountains in nearby Colorado. Nonetheless, convinced of its grandeur, Fremont insisted on making this historic climb, dragging his party along. This ascent was crucial for Fremont's career and image as the pathfinder, but according to Preuss, it was more comedic than heroic. Carson, the leader, walked too quickly, causing tensions within the group. Fremont, always excitable, appointed a young man to take the lead, as he couldn't act as the guide himself. Soon after, Fremont developed a headache, and the group stopped around 11 o'clock. He decided to postpone the climb until the next morning hoping for renewed strength and cooler weather. The following day, they attempted the ascent again, but the party soon became separated. Preuss found himself alone in the snow, 1,000 feet below the summit, while Fremont had grown hungry and returned to camp. Unable to find his way up, Preuss took some readings and also returned to camp. Dripping with sarcasm, he wrote, I could not keep from remarking that in such an undertaking, some preparations for sleeping, eating, and drinking would not be altogether amiss, and might indeed be more conducive to success. They finally reached the summit on the 15th, and the climb became a legendary part of Fremont's legacy. On the return trip, the group encountered the Platte River, which was in flood. Fremont decided to split his men, sending the larger group overland while he, Preuss, 
and five others navigated the rapids using a raft he had brought for just such an occasion. Shortly after setting off, the raft capsized in the rapids, resulting in the loss of many scientific records and data they had gathered. These stories perfectly illustrate a man who, throughout most of his career in exploration, relied heavily on those around him to do the work. When he did use his own judgment, it often lacked common sense. Fremont had an extraordinary streak of good luck, which is remarkable given the dangers of his profession. Many of his expeditions benefited from mild winters and favorable weather. Had he faced even a moderate blizzard, his entire party might have perished. In one expedition, his men dragged a massive carriage-mounted howitzer that fired 12-inch cannonballs intended to intimidate Native Americans. This action alarmed leaders in Washington, who were concerned that a supposedly peaceful scientific expedition was carrying such a weapon, which could provoke Mexico or Britain. They sent orders for him to leave it behind, but he never received the message. Eventually, he abandoned the howitzer in the snow high in the mountains, but not before using it to hunt buffalo by firing indiscriminately into herds. Fremont was a man who stumbled into his marriage, narrowly escaped numerous deadly encounters with weather that always seemed to bypass him, Native Americans who somehow overlooked him, and political missteps that rarely had consequences. However, in the end, his luck ran out. Following an unsuccessful bid for the presidency, he faced a series of unfortunate events during the Civil War, where he served as an inept and unpopular general, ultimately being relieved of his command by Lincoln. His poor business decisions squandered the wealth he had amassed from his exploration career, leaving him destitute. In his final years, it was his talented wife who supported them through her writing. Fremont passed away in 1890 in a boarding house, reflecting on a life that had seen both triumphs and tribulations. I wonder what happened to John C. Fremont. Hugh Glass is the Terminator Hugh Glass had already spent several years in the western wilderness when he joined an expedition up the Missouri River in 1823 with the company led by William Ashley and Andrew Henry. At that time, these men were key players in the booming fur trapping industry. The expedition traveled up the Missouri River to the Grand River near present-day Mobridge, South Dakota. From there, Glass and a small group led by Henry set out overland towards Yellowstone. Approximately 12 miles south of what is now Lemon, South Dakota, Glass encountered a grizzly bear and her two cubs while scouting. Separated from his group, Glass was attacked by the bear before he could fire his rifle. Armed only with a knife and his bare hands, Glass managed to kill the bear, but not without sustaining severe injuries. His companions, alerted by his screams, found him gravely wounded beneath the dead bear. They did their best to bandage his wounds and waited for him to die. Pressed for time to reach Yellowstone, Henry asked for volunteers to stay with Glass until he passed away and then bury him. John Fitzgerald and a young Jim Bridger, yes, the famous Jim Bridger, volunteered and began digging his grave. However, after three days, Glass was still clinging to life. Fitzgerald and Bridger grew anxious when they spotted a band of hostile Native Americans approaching. In their panic, they took Glass's belongings, including his knife and rifle, and abandoned him in the shallow grave they had dug. They covered him with a bearskin and a thin layer of dirt and leaves, leaving him for dead. However, he did not die. When he regained consciousness, he realized he had been abandoned. Alone and unarmed in hostile territory, Glass faced dire circumstances. His leg was broken, his wounds were festering, and his scalp was nearly torn off. The flesh on his back 
had been ripped away, exposing his rib bones. The nearest help was 200 miles away at Fort Kiowa. His only protection was the bearskin left by Bridger and Fitzgerald. Determined to survive, Glass set his own broken leg and, on September 9, 1823, began crawling southward toward the Cheyenne River, about 100 miles away. Fever and infection frequently rendered him unconscious. Once, he awoke to find a grizzly bear standing over him. According to legend, the bear licked his maggot-infested wounds, which may have helped prevent further infection. Glass sustained himself on wild berries, roots, and anything he could find while crawling. On one occasion, he managed to drive away two wolves from a downed bison calf and ate the raw meat. Despite these extreme hardships, Glass continued his arduous journey toward safety. It took Glass two months to crawl to the Cheyenne River. There, he constructed a raft from a fallen tree and allowed the current to carry him downstream to the Missouri River and eventually to Fort Kiowa, located about four miles north of present-day Chamberlain. After many months of recovery, Glass set out to find and exact revenge on the two men who had left him for dead. Glass eventually located them. When he found Bridger at a fur trading post on the Yellowstone River, he chose not to kill him because Bridger was only 19 years old. Later, when he confronted Fitzgerald, he refrained from killing him as well, since Fitzgerald had joined the army by then. Glass's decision to spare their lives speaks volumes about his character. Despite surviving his ordeal driven by thoughts of revenge, he showed mercy when the moment arrived. This act of clemency highlights his resilience and thoughtfulness, qualities that contributed to his legendary status. Cabeza de Vaca stars in his own real-life movie. In 1527, Álvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca embarked from Spain as part of a royal expedition aimed at colonizing the mainland of North America. After navigating the relatively straightforward journey across the Atlantic, the expedition encountered a hurricane near Cuba. This setback didn't deter them, and they secured a new ship, likely with the natives relieved to see them depart eventually landing near present-day Tampa Bay, Florida. There, the expedition leader, Narvaez, claimed the land for Spain. However, this marked the beginning of their troubles. Despite being unfamiliar with the region, Narvaez decided to divide the group, sending some men by land and others by sea in search of gold, which he believed was somewhere nearby. Devaca opposed this plan but was overruled. The land party, including Devaca, soon became lost in Florida's harsh environment. After months of battling hostile natives and navigating through swamps, the group reached Apalachee Bay with 242 men. Mistakenly believing they were close to Mexico, they found themselves starving, injured, and trapped in swampy terrain. In a desperate bid to escape, they devised a plan. They slaughtered their horses, melted down the metal from their gear, and used deer hide to create a bellows, forging tools and nails to construct five rudimentary boats. Cabeza de Vaca was put in charge of one vessel, each accommodating fifty men. Depleted of supplies, they followed the coastline westward until they encountered the Mississippi River. The powerful current swept them into the Gulf of Mexico, where another hurricane scattered the five rafts, with some, including Narvaez's, lost forever. Two of the rafts, including Cabeza de Vaca's, wrecked near Galveston Island. The survivors attempted to repair the rafts using their remaining clothes, but a large wave soon washed them away. This tragic yet somewhat absurd scene marked the beginning of their struggle. As the number of survivors quickly dwindled, they were enslaved by various Native American tribes, being passed from one tribe to another over several years. By 1532, 
Five years after leaving Spain on what had turned into a disastrous journey, only three other members of the original expedition were still alive. Alonso del Castillo Maldonado, Andres Dorantes de Carranza, and Estevanico, an African slave. Despite these hardships, Cabeza de Vaca ended up exploring much of what is now the southwestern United States and parts of northern Mexico. He traveled on foot along the Gulf of California coast to present-day Sinaloa, Mexico, over roughly eight years. During this time, he lived in extreme poverty and occasionally in slavery. Eventually, Cabeza de Vaca reached the colonized lands of New Spain, encountering fellow Spaniards near modern-day Culiacan. From there, he traveled to Mexico City and later sailed back to Europe in 1537. Remarkably, despite his long enslavement by various tribes, he became a staunch advocate for Native American rights. His advocacy brought him into conflict with authorities, leading to his arrest for poor administration in 1544 and his return to Spain for trial in 1545. Although he was eventually exonerated, he never returned to the colonies. Cabeza de Vaca died in poverty in Valladolid around 1558. Nevertheless, from a historical perspective, he emerged as a significant figure. His written account of his adventures is now considered a classic of colonial literature, and his name remains well known today. Please like and share if you find the video content interesting and useful. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and comment below so as not to miss the upcoming interesting videos. Thanks for watching.